Possession crucial from this. How much longer will the referee allow? Dublin lead by a point. And there's the whistle. It's over. It's over. We earned it by winning the last two matches on the road, and that's not going to be taken away from us. But what I love in Hurland, I love players that will never give in. He hits it. He hits it. It's over the ball. Welcome along to our latest episode of the GAA podcast, a hurling weekend, couple of things to pick out, Tipperary motoring, cork stuttering, Claire moving well, and there's barely a word about the All-Ireland Champions Limerick, which is no surprise. We're going to chat about the state of the nation in hurling funding as well. Shane Dowling joins myself and Rory this week. How are you keeping, Shane? I'm good, Jackie. Yeah, back into the swing of things now, so I had a nice bit of time off, and uh, I was just saying it was my son's christening on Saturday, so... Uh, things have definitely changed over the last couple of months, but really looking forward now to getting back into the things. Uh, well, congratulations. 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 Yeah. It's a whole new life for you now, Shane. <laughs> yeah, that goes what I was saying, but uh, yeah, so it, was a, it was a mad house beforehand. It's, uh, it's even madder now. Yeah, I mean. Change, change, changing nappies, a dab hand at it at this stage, I'd say, Shane. You can nearly do it one hand at this stage, Rory. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'd say there's a lot of people who uh, definitely have mm. felt that boat over the last few years. Well, mm. congratulations. Delighted to have you back in action for it all. Let's start with the game of the weekend then in Thurlis because certainly felt to me, Shane, like there was a championship vibe about this. Yeah. Lots of talk about Eamon O'Shea going back down there. The biggest thing to note over the weekend is lots of people have been talking about Liam Cowell's under 20s, that they were coming, they were coming. Look to me at the weekend like they are going to be the backbone of this team come to the championship the way that they're motoring now. They're really, really firing. They are. And to be honest, like they were probably the form team in the championship last year for, for long periods up until maybe just obviously they, 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 they kind of limped out of it quite poorly against Galway uh, last year. But I mean, they did a really, really good league. I mean, they were within a couple of minutes of popping the ball beating Limerick. And at one stage last year, they were nearly knock, knocking Limerick out of the All Ireland uh, Championship because depending on how the result was going to go down in Ennis with Carr versus Clare. So, listen, I'll be honest, you know, I'd say not that many people follow me, but for any foolish people that do and have uh, listened to my commentary over the last while, even in Waterford, I've been a massive fan of Liam Cahill and Mikey Beavens. I think they've done an exceptional job down there. Uh, you know, okay, people say, well, they didn't win much, you know, but they still can't, like the only team to beat them for a couple of years was Limerick. Um, you know, did obviously did a very good job with Tip uh, underage as well. And now they're they're showing at senior level. So it's no surprise to me how Tip Rary are going. And I don't know if, if he's going to get away with a team in transition or the under 20s. I don't know if he's going to get away with that this year. I think there's a team there now in the panel that are that are coming nicely. And, you know, I heard Liam saying it last night, just that he's maybe timing it a bit better this year. Yeah. Because ultimately, uh, you know, I suppose he won't get away with it this year if the same thing happens. He needs to ensure that there's a bit of longevity or at least that they perform at a much higher level at the latter end of the, uh, at the championship. So, um. And, and listen, I don't know was the scoreline a fair reflection on the game. I think Tipperary were eight points up and did a really good goal chance uh, that was missed and then got him down and got a point. So I think they were a lot better value than I know the goal. Obviously, at the end, made it look a bit more better. But um, yeah, they were very impressive. And I think what you have to come back into that team as well, Rory, you know, Jason Ford, Carl Barrett, Noel McGrath, you know, I, uh, Shane's right. Maybe it's just all about timing it, trying to get the right balance there. But he looked impressed with what he's seen over the last couple of weeks. There'll be fantastic competition for places, which is exactly where um, Liam Cahill will want to be uh, heading into the back end of the league. It's a perfect league for them in many ways. They've had, you know, possibly their two toughest matches at the start, which is Dublin and Galway, and they've come out of those with four points. They can really now start to focus big time. They're going to be in the top three, which will qualify for the league next year. They will probably be in a semi-final, which will give them an, one massively competitive game in advance, which will be fantastic prep for Munster Championship. And I think this these next two weeks now will be an awful lot of, I, I presume, given, the, given that you're in, heading into break week, where a lot of teams will engage in quite a serious amount of physical preparation. So I think when you come into that, that little bit of a break week and you've come on the back of a couple of wins, your momentum is good. The spirit will be very good in the camp. They're starting to find a couple of players, the form of Garrod O'Connor, if you're picking her of the year right now, two weeks in. And the first week of February, he probably be, you know, the front runner, outstanding in the Fitzgibbon, outstanding. He two man of the match performances back to back, you know, can take the freeze. He's certainly a, a handful up front and um, he, they have a plenty of um, options in the back, in the defence as well. I think Ronan Maher is certainly settling into that full back role. He's very mobile, so he gives you a, a different kind of dimension in that regard. 
are you robbing Peter to pay Paul? They have lots of Peters and lots of Pauls to rob. So I think it's a good position for them to be in. So I think, you know, Tipperary and good fettle. Yeah. What about Galway then, Shane? Because for parts of that game, you saw a Galway team who are starting to click. It's very early in the season. And I heard, in fairness, I was listening to Liam Sheedy last night saying, give Eamon O'Shea summer ball with these lads and they'll be playing yeah. well. And you can definitely get a sense that this is a team in a different place right now. But what do you make of what you've seen from them so far? Listen, obviously not going to get carried away two weeks in, but I think this is uh, it's year three of Henry now and uh, they need something. There's no point in saying otherwise. Uh, and like, yeah, again, listen to Liam saying give him and O'Shea and Summer Ball, but they need that. They need something. Um, but they're not that far away. They only need to get minor improvements. I mean, if you look at the last two years, I mean, two years ago, you know, Ren Limerick to the wire. And again, last year, I mean, for 25 minutes that first half, and I know a game is played over 75 minutes, not 25 minutes, but it's there. It just hasn't been continued. Uh, and they have they have very, very skillful players and very, very skillful forwards, but they haven't, they just haven't come to fruition, I suppose, in the big days in the last couple of years. And that's exactly, I, I'd imagine, what Henry's going looking for, is that can Eamon O'Shea just bring that, you know, extra couple of percent that's needed because they have the players, they have the quality, but they just don't know if they got the... And, and I know the word consistency in Galway has been kind of shown around for maybe a good number of years now. Um, but they were poor yesterday for large stages. And I mean, what what they were actually poor at is is hurling, not work ethic or anything like that. There were so many balls going to ground, uh, missed passes. I mean, their goalie was very lucky to get away to give a hand pass and nearly intercepted. So that's what I was saying earlier on about the scoreline. I don't think it was a fair reflection on actually how the game panned out. Um, so the question I'm asking is, you know, where are they at hurling wise? I'd say they're a long way away. I'd say I, I don't know, but I'd imagine they're having a whole pile of work done. And like everything, they're not going to be judged on the league. They need to get major honours this year. And I'd imagine no different than maybe Tipperary in a lot of counties. They are now timing the run for the latter stages because it looked to me, maybe I'm wrong, that Eamon O'Shea probably has a whole pile of work done ju judging on what the hurling was like yesterday. I thought Tipperary were miles better. Yeah. Listen, they're not the only county in that same boat. There was a lot of counties who look like they're not hurling too much at this point of the year. Let's move on to a couple of the other matches. The Waterford Clare one is interesting, Rory, because I do think everybody talked about, you know, Waterford getting back into Walsh Park. We're going to see something. It's going to happen. Same thing. Same thing we're seeing with this Waterford team. They're falling away in the second half. From a Clare point of view, though, for Brian Lowen to be able to go there to get two wins from two. And they're now in that same position as Tipperary, where they're comfortably in the top three probably now. Their passage looks pretty pretty safe, given the way that they're going. And I think he'll be nicely happy with where they're going. Oh, I think hugely happy, Jackie. I think um, Claire for me, are definitely ranked number two. Um, yeah. And maybe by a little bit of a distance at this stage. I think they've consistently shown, to be fair to them, that they're the one team that can give Limerick the most trouble. I think that's probably going to bear out again potentially this year. It's early days, I know, but he's got a lot of depth. I mean, Ed McCarthy looks like a fellow that spent the whole winter in the gym. There's a marked difference in terms of his physical preparation. And I think he's an example, really, for players that might want to make that step up, particularly certain county that's not too far from home, you know, in terms of that, what you can actually achieve. Um they have uh, John Conlon was back yesterday. They still have the likes of Tony, Tony Kelly and Shane O'Donnell to come back into the mix. They're after finding a couple of players. Did a lad play in midfield? I I'll be straight up. I didn't. I had not heard a whole pile about Sean Ryan before. Unbelievable, unbelievable. The the form of David Fitzgerald, Cahill Malone. You know, I think Claire for me are in an unbelievable position and I think they will be right in there for all the major honours this season I think Brian Lowen Liam mentioned last night will sleep well I think it was very very happy bus going home and um, you know a fantastic opening couple of rounds certainly for Clare I heard Brian Lowen saying afterwards he was asked you know he obviously still has 11 players involved in Fitzgibbon as well Shane which is a juggling act in itself and he was kind of asked are you going to rest them are you going to give them a break and he was like here they're only two weeks into the season you know mm. so it sounded to me like he was like look uh, let me take responsibility for what this team is going to do and it sounded maybe he doesn't want to win the league who knows but he, he was pretty gung-ho about trying to get as many of them involved in as many matches as he possibly can to get a real look at, at where he's going. This is it, and like you know, we all know the way the Monster Championship is, and you know how hard it's going to be when the time comes round. So I think 
what we're seeing in more recent times than maybe previous times, you know, when with the new mo um, months around Robin is management teams know that they need to have a huge amount of depth in their squad. Even if you had a full body, a full deck to pick from, you're still going to pick up injuries along the way. You're still going to have tired bodies. That's if you had a full deck. Now, if you don't have a full deck, now you need even more people again. Right? So you do need 24, 26 people. And it's not 20 anymore. Um, it might be 20 or 21, as I said, if you have everyone available to you, but it could be 24, 25. And I think that's what management teams are trying to, you know, look at now and see, right, who can I actually bring into this 24 or five people that I can go to war with over that Monster Championship time? And that's exactly what Brian is doing. So he's probably in one way delighted that he has 11 lads that he doesn't have to worry about right now because that's given game time to the, to the people that Rory said there a while ago. Uh, so he is in a very strong position. And you could say the same with Davey, you know, he has a lot of bodies that are out injured at the minute. Yeah. The, the beauty for him is the bodies that are out injured are well, proven. I don't know if that's the right word, but they're there for a long number of years. Anyway, he knows exactly what he has with them. Uh, and that's then given other lads opportunities to play like they did yesterday. And they will also learn, OK, who can I go to war with ahead of, you know, in the next couple of months? But I judge Ward for that with Davies' body language yesterday. And while there was a home game against, obviously, Claire with all that's going on with him and Brian Law and et cetera, et cetera, it was a case of that it, you just move on. I didn't see any urgency in anything yesterday, including their play, by the way. I thought they were quite poor for, for a lot of the game. Um, but I don't think he's going to be worried now because, again, Davy has openly said, don't judge me after year one, judge me after year two. And if I don't do anything in year two, well, or maybe year three, if he gets that far, well, you know, so he knows he's under pressure now as well. But if he if Stephen Bennett's injury was more serious, who knows? It looked like a hamstring injury yesterday. If he was to be without him, that is a different scenario where even if it's only a couple of weeks, missing him for one championship game uh, in early April could be a complete swing of a match for them. It could, but you need, again, you need every, when you're trying to make a breakthrough, coming on the back of the year that they had last year, you know, he's going to want to get, he's going to not want to go around saying, oh, he was missing or he was missing. He's yeah, going to yeah, say, yeah. we have everybody now. I don't want any more excuses. And actually, I was reading one or two of the interviews of the Waterford selectors over the last couple of weeks. And I just get the feeling they're done with excuses. Uh, I think they just want everyone to be there. I said, the players have taken a good look at themselves and they know that they need to step up to the plate this year because you can't just always go blaming managers. Essentially, yeah. it's the players have to step up as well. Mm. Look, we've talked a lot about Waterford, so we'll leave them aside for the moment because there's another big issue we need to talk about Rory and sadly it's Cork again. Um, <laughs> after watching them at the weekend, are you any more convinced that they are solving problems? Because there was elements of their play on Saturday night that were very encouraging, but yet again, they're scratching their head, no points after two games. Mm. I heard. I think I heard Liam describe Liam Sheedy on last night's show describe their first twenty minutes as abysmal. I go strong. I'd be stronger than that. It was borderline disgraceful. You are playing Kilkenny, a traditional rival, going back I don't know how many years. You've your first home match in Super Value Park, Cueve, hurling our football. The leagues are back since the twenty seventh of January, so this is the first time the Cork public were going to be going down there. Relatively big numbers. There was twenty. 16,000 20, people or something. There was 20,000, like 16 and a half thousand, but that's paid in. That doesn't include children. So there was probably 20, maybe more than 20,000 down there. And for them to play the way they did in the first 20 minutes was beyond baffling. I could not understand it. It was like 15 lads that had met each other below in the Roachstone Park Hotel for the first time and got the bus up to Parky Cueve afterwards. It was bizarre now. I couldn't, I couldn't make head nor tail of it. I mean, Kilkenny set the tone, they set the pace, everything about them was quick, fast, efficient. Cork was so passive, disengaged. Now, they rallied just before half time. Conor O'Callaghan, who I think potentially is a little bit of a find at midfield and could potentially force his way into the team, he scored a goal, which I think maybe gave him a little bit of a lift, and they scored 1 4 without reply. But it was atrocious. Like, I just, it was so disappointing. And I think it would have definitely angered Pat. Um, I think we saw a bit of a reaction in the second half where maybe they could have actually sneaked a win in the end, but it would have been a disservice. I think something that I de definitely noticed as well, Jackie, and this isn't partic particular to this game on Saturday night, is when a team allows another team an 8, 9, 10 point lead. And invariably, what we have seen in the past is teams will reestablish themselves in that game, but it will usurp 
and drain so much energy to actually get that comeback into such an order that what I've noticed is a sort of a pattern whereby the team that has allowed the comeback to happen almost get a little bit of a pit stop and for the last 10 minutes push on and end up winning the game anyway because you've allowed yourself to be you know so far behind initially like nine eight nine points behind in the, after 20 minutes it was just horrendous but i think you have to give kilkenny massive credit as well i think again when you talk about teams in good fettle do you a lachlan gales lads are starting to kind of drift trip back into the panel you know, he's found one or two players mikey carey coming back is huge plus for them i thought he was outstanding he took him off tw- uh, i think about 15 minutes ago but i'd say to empty the tank at that stage and um, they deserved their win, to be perfectly honest. I felt that it would have been a total disservice had they not gone out of Parky Creeve on Saturday night with two points. Yeah, I thought Kilkenny were full value for it. And to be mm-hmm. fair, given what had happened with them the previous week in Wexford, that's a big statement by Derek Ling, I think, Shane, for Kilkenny to be able to come down there to get that victory. It probably says as much about their team. Yes, the, the Cork issues are well put there by Rory but let's focus on Kilkenny for a minute and how important this victory on the road is for them I'll focus on them in two seconds but just to touch on Cork before I move on for them right I was working at the um, the, for the the opening game there last year um, Cork versus Limerick Mm -hmm. uh, and Cork won and you'd swear Cork after winning the All-Ireland standing ovation players coming off the field you know it was the first or second week in February as well it was as if this was the greatest thing that has happened Cork in so long um I actually think what happened the weekend will be a good thing for Cork because now they'll have a reference a reference point, right? It was so bad that they'll actually now go and review it and talk about it. Whereas if they like beaten Limerick last year, big win, they'll move on, they'll move on, and then they just get caught. Whereas now they'll be able to take a step back and actually realize the problems that are there and go after it. So sometimes I think so, things like that, if you can catch them earlier on in the year, they could turn out to be a benefit. I don't know, will it, by the way? But, but the problem is, though, Shane, right? It's a very quick turnaround to work that out because you've got Waterford coming to the park again in two weeks' time. Then you're away for your final two games against Offaly and Wexford. And they now have to win all of them, basically, to secure their top flight for next season. So you can talk about like learning these lessons and all that. But if they don't learn them quickly, they're going to be learning them in a whole lot of different space next year in Division 2. I agree. And I've been Cork's biggest critic over the last couple of years because I have just seen them play games where it's just kind of been non-contact hurling. And uh, I don't know, have we seen enough evidence that that's going to change this year? I'm just saying I, you'd rather something like that to happen now rather than waiting for the Munster Championship. But to go back to Kilkenny, I mean, it's of no surprise probably to any of us here that they're able to come and produce a performance like that. Have they gotten enough credit over the last couple of years? Possibly not. As Rory said there, the likes of Michael Carey back is huge for them as well. You know, Derek Ling now is after learning last year. Um, so, again, they probably haven't got the credit that they deserve. But you, you, the one thing you always know what you're going to get with Kilkenny is what you don't know what you're going to get with Cork. They're always Correct. going to... Yeah. No, that's, that's just the bottom line. Yeah, therein lies the problem, Rory. That's it, yeah. And it's absolute Like, that is it in a nutshell. You were like, there are certain non negotiables with Kilkenny, and that is work rate, you know, the application, 100% commitment, going for every ball, never giving up, and playing full on, full blooded, like 100% for 70 minutes. And if that's not good enough, they take their beat and they move on. That's a non negotiable with Kilkenny. That we did not see that for the first 20 minutes on Saturday night from Cork, and they're in. Exactly, as Shane said, lies the problem. Yeah. Well, problems for them to sort out. Let's move on because there was drama, like a huge amount of drama in both Wexford and Antrim in the other games at the weekend. You look at the Wexford one first, Shane, and they eventually snatch a draw with 13 men. But it seemed to me like a lot of talk around that Jack O'Connor red card when you look at it. I think the difficulty for Sean Stack at the time was that he only saw the aftermath of the hand moving out and he sent him off rightly because he did interfere with the face guard, whatever Jack O'Connor felt about it. If you do that, you're gone. The thing is, David King is clearly grabbing his face guard as well and it should have been none or both of them. And that's and I think, listen, by the letter of the law, they both should have got sent off. But the anger around Wexford Park over it was probably rightly felt. It was. Did, do we mention the war and bring up VAR or, or, or health referee? I think, I think it has but, to get there. At but, some it's point. Really, but, listen, but it's, right. a, re- it's yeah. a really interesting point, though, Shane, on VAR. Because what would happen in that scenario, let's say if you have a contentious call and somebody says, OK, I want to contest that through VAR. 
-hmm. So Offaly say we or Wexford say we want to contest that. So they say, okay, well, we're going to stand over our decision, but instead, instead of Jack O'Connor being confirmed for his red, we're going to send off another fella as well. So <laughs> it became like like it, it's it's you know it's I tell you, it's all a laugh and a joke now, right? Mm -hmm. Imagine that was a imagine that was a Leinster final, yeah. ten minutes to go or fifteen minutes to go. You know, so it, it's uh, as I said, it's, <laughs> you need a full pod to talk about that and the pros and the cons to it. But it, it, listen, and that's the, this is the piece about John Stack and any other referee, right? He saw that in a real split second. Absolutely. Correct, yeah. So, like, there is no point here in blaming John Stack because if he thought he saw the Afri fella putting the helmet, well, he would have got sent off as well. But he just yep. didn't see, it, right? And Absolutely. Then, and but he needs people, to be helped. Exactly. But then he left him. So, well, it is his job to spot these things. Yeah, but he's human. So, a referee is going to miss all these things loads of times. You know what about Lynn Gordon missing the eleven steps uh, in the in the in the in the, in the game? Claire Waterford with the Waterford goal. They're going. All these things are going to be there. So um, listen, it was probably disappointing from Wexford, but they clung on in this day and age. Would um, Wexford sorry be expected to beat an awfully team down there? Yes, they would. But again, do you um, say it was disappointing from Wexford, or do you compliment Offaly? I would say I'd probably compliment Offaly. And again, you know, for the for the people that did um, tune into the show last night. I thought there were some unbelievable clips shown as to the effort and application that Offaly showed, and that's all any manager can ask for. Yeah, and I think that, to be honest, Rory, when you're looking at the work that's been done there, that would have been a step up for Offaly. And I think they are proving to people that, you know, when we're talking about the wider picture of what's being done for hurling, it seems to me, looking from the outside in, that the right things are being done in Offaly. And they have, in Brian Dignan, um, an unbelievable target, man. You know, I think it was 1-6 in the end. Mm -hmm. uh, to see it like a top class player, I think their reaction on the full time whistle would give you an indication that they probably felt this was definitely a point dropped. They, what an opportunity to go to Wexford Park, get two points on the board, potentially stay, you know, go after maybe given what the travails in Cork, etc. They wouldn't necessarily hold too many fears of playing them at the minute. So I think it was an opportunity missed. I mean, ultimately, I know the second sending off happened so late. But it was against 13 men. And I think from that point of view, it was they will feel that maybe they left a point after them. But played played unbelievable hurling. I think it, there was a couple of things that struck me in terms of the game itself. Like, it was, firstly, it was fantastic to see a match under lights in Wexford Park because that's yeah. the first time that we've seen it, obviously, this season and on, on TV. Um, the National Anthem beforehand, there was a little girl sang the National Anthem beforehand. What a performance. What a performance. And we've heard it about rugby and the little lad that sang it yesterday in the Aviva. But the girl who sang the National Anthem, I think she was only nine or ten. Like, she just, like it was incredible. Um, I think the big thing from a Wexford point of view, they're going to have an issue now because those two red cards are straight red cards. So they'll potentially, unless they contest them, they're going to they're going to have suspensions. They're also already missing the likes of Matthew O'Hanlon, uh, Rory O'Connor, uh, Liam Og McGovern, and a few a few other really key you know stalwarts of their team. And so, like this is obviously going to test Rossiter's panel. He's got a couple of weeks maybe to sort it out, and there'll be a couple of players that'll trip trip back in. But yeah, I think look, I, I would say it was a point gain from Wexford in the end. It should have been a match that they should they probably would have targeted to win. I think Wexford can be quite frustrating. Go down to Nolan Park the week before, put in a performance like they did against Kilkenny and then be as flat the following week at home in a game where pe many people feel that they should win is probably classic Wexford in many ways. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, it's getting that consistency right will be a big challenge for Keith Rossiter. Yep, agreed. Uh, if you thought that one was dramatic, though, Corrigan Park, I mean, I was watching the highlights of this and I just thought, what a difficult way to lose a game with Tiernan Smith in the Antrim goal, just having a one of those moments that you just don't want to watch back. But I was thinking though, Shane, for Dublin, if they are to try to cement their own passage for next season, those important points on the road to go all the way up there. They've got Limerick at home next, which, you know, based on what we're watching with Limerick, they're still only in second gear. They're barely getting out of it and not needing to either, by the way. Then they've got to go away to Galway and they've got their final home game against Westmead. So it's an important point for Dublin on the road to go away and get two points up there with a performance that they have been hit and miss so far this year. So they, I think, you know, Mihal will take a lot from that. Well, I, I actually thought Andrew, like, 
would win the game, to be honest, the weekend. Uh, like it should become a if it if it if it comes to a surprise to anybody in the GA circles that Dublin struggled to get a win in Carrigan Park, well then yeah. they haven't been watching Andrew's performances up there over the last couple of years and been asked about it and Obviously, you have to retreat back into the goals this year with the club. I kind of get exactly how he probably feels, and I know these things happen, uh, and will no doubt happen to me uh, before I finish up, whenever that'll be in, in the goals. But uh, like Andrew should have won the game, right? Yeah. So it done, robbed it. it. That's the bottom line. So Michal just wanted, like, if you offered him a one point win before the game, I'd say he would have taken it. Um, but sometimes a one point win isn't enough. You still like to see a decent performance, not so sure the performance was decent, but they still got it. Uh, I, I'm not convinced on Dublin. I, I just. I'm just not convinced. Uh, you could say they're a team in transition if you want to use that word. Uh, as you said, they have a couple of difficult fixtures coming up. Um, so I just don't know are we going to see much from them this year. You know, I, what are you judging that off? Opening two games in the league, possibly. Um, but overall, I think Michal has a big job in his hands up there. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, Darren Leeson probably would have looked and said, OK, Limerick first. Do I really put all my eggs in that basket now and I'm not going to win anyway or do I just keep them for that one big game against Dublin? He'd be absolutely sickened that they couldn't get a, a result there. Yes, uh, absolutely sickened because he knows, I suppose, that these games are massive up there and um, no, I'd say they're fierce disappointed. But I would say in previous years, for them to think that they could have beaten a Dublin up there would have come as a shock. I would suspect that they expected to get a win up there yesterday and that's why they're probably so disappointed. Yeah, body language looked like that, Rory, to be fair. And I think Shane's right. They would have wanted and targeted that game because I think the All-Ireland Champions is probably a different prospect in, in on day one. But that Dublin game was right in the melting pot for the whole game. Oh, well, yeah, it was a, a terrific game. And like they played some very good hurling in spells. The only issue, I suppose, in Corrigan Park, and especially at this time of the year, the wind can make play a very significant role in terms of what you do with and against it. It's, it's quite high up as we see the mountains very close in the background and the pitch itself is quite tight and small. You you could, you know, you could see lads basically, it's certainly in the first half, Dublin were firing pints over from inside their own half back line. From an Antrim perspective, I think, you know, it will be a bit of a thickener. And as Shane said, like it was definitely a game that they would have targeted, but I, I suppose from Dublin's perspective, it was a difficult day for them. Obviously, the news of Shane, Han Shane O'Hanlon breaking beforehand. There's there's a lot of Vincent's lads on the panel that would have had an effect. He would have the, the lad, they would have all known him. They would have all been quite close to him. It was a big shock, I suppose, for everybody involved in Dublin circles. Um, it was very very sudden, and I suppose look, it was quite poignant beforehand in terms of minute silence and all of that. Did that have an effect on their performance? I don't think so. I think look, Antrim played really good in lots of in lots of spells, and just unfortunately didn't get the win on the day. But you know, I think Dublin will be delighted to have gotten out of there with two points. Yeah. One player, sorry, that just wasn't mentioned last night. I thought um, was was Connell Cunning. Like yeah, uh, the, the, one from. four, what one four, four five player? Like he he was unbelievable yesterday, and uh, you know he is a really really quality player and. You know, sometimes when Kerry play and Shane Conway plays for Kerry, it's all fusing a different county. He can get into a lot of teams as well. Donald Cunning's been an exceptional for Antrim over the last couple of years. And I thought some of the scores he got yesterday against an opposition who would fancy themselves to go close in Leinster. I thought he was really, really good, actually. He, did, he definitely deserves a mention. Yeah, absolutely. Always good to highlight some people to be looking out for over the weekend. One uh, team that we, I feel like we've hardly spoken about over the last couple of weeks, Shane, is Limerick. You know, it just Long seems like they're, last, Jackie. Yeah, they're just bubbling <laughs> away nicely. You know, as... I actually think Joe Fortune said it well last night that that was an unbelievable day for Westmead hurling yesterday. And it's hard to quantify what a day like that means to them because they're putting it up against the All-Ireland Champions, but ultimately you don't win because for Limerick, you know that they think in their heads, we're going to win this anyway. This is just the way we're motoring or whatever. But the narrative after the game, it's it's hard to know where to go with it because on one hand, you want to give massive credit to Westmead because they're doing Trojan work and have been doing really good things in the championship and now the league as well. But also with Limerick, just don't really know what's happening in there. So maybe you give us a sense of what both sides of that coin look like. Yeah, um, I think I would more go down the road of Westmead doing really, really well than Limerick just, you know not turn up if you want to call it. I mean, they had a humongous win against Antrim the week before. Uh, they still had, you could call it, you know, same amount of starters from the from the starting 15, if you want to call it that. Like so, uh, and they just couldn't get going. You know, I know it was a very, very um, much of a stop-start game, but I've been involved in Limerick teams, um, you know, that have gone to Westmead and have won fairly comprehensively. Like so, they, as you said, they definitely deserve a lot of credit. 
Uh, and I could even, I was watching John Kiley's interview afterwards. Uh, he, you could see by his body language, he wasn't, he wasn't too yeah. impressed. And it just, I suppose it'll be a timely reminder to everybody in Limerick that if we have, if we do maybe go up and play some of these teams with a soft mindset, um, you know, this is what can happen. Uh, and like I said a while ago about it could be good for Cork, I think yes, it could actually be a good thing for Limerick. I don't know if people want to hear that because it would, as I said, just give, um, it would just give a reminder to everybody that, you know, we can't just take our foot off the pedal here. And the other side of it too is, you know, there there was people yesterday given a chance. They were given an opportunity and they yeah. want to put their hand up to be included. And they're like, there's going to be another cut coming into Limerick panel very, very shortly, I'd say. So there was lads probably playing yesterday's fighting for survival. There was lads playing, trying to get into the panel. And then there was lads fighting to try and get into the starting 15. So it's not as if anyone that was playing there yesterday uh, had Lacking any motivation. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So um, I would give full credit to Westmead. It, it, that's the angle I'd be going down anyway. Yeah, I think what's going on in Westmeath is kind of symptomatic of that development in the other counties, Rory. And it was one thing that was touched on this week with the, the hurling and the funding and the conversation that's happening around the place. I think Joe, Joe Fortune has articulated very well what's happening in that middle bar of counties, let's say. So you can talk about the issues around the Louds and the Fermanas and, and everything that's happening there with them potentially being excluded from the league with that. A format that was proposed, which like very clearly got ran down by the bulk of the hurling population. But for that group in the middle, Joe Fortune is still talking about traveling 60 miles to go tra training in Dublin because they don't have the facilities. They still don't have the amount of clubs or players that they need to succeed. How are they ever going to get to a level where they can compete, where he can sit there justifiably on the couch and say, we ran the All-Ireland champions really close and do it on a consistent basis where it's not just this one-off performance that's get lauded because they go and beat Wexford in the championship and everybody says, oh, they had one amazing day. Because that's not the case. They are clearly trying their hardest to do things at their very best level. But until we give them the supports to do that, I don't think that they can do that consistently. It's a... Yeah, it's a big question. I mean, one of the things that came out was the challenge that they face in terms of access and facilities. Now, the only thing I would say on that is that's not exclusive or specific to yeah. teams further down the food chain. I very regularly get requests from Dublin Intercounty underage teams to come out and train on our facilities where I'm living. I know I always say no, <laughs> right? But it'll give you an indication of the challenge that is faced by teams right across the board, particularly in counties where there's a big urban population. I know Limerick have Rathkeel, which is, is a club. I mean, for, it, Rory Rathkeel, like just to put in context. Is... Yeah, it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not in palatial, by the way. I've been Absolutely. down there, you know, it's not like the lap of luxury in Rathkeel. I was down there only a couple of weeks ago and yeah, it's, 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 it's fine set up. No issues on that front. And I'm sure they have access to it when and where they need but it's certainly no centre of excellence. Would that be fair, Shane? That's, that's a good way of putting it, Jeff. Yeah. It's not a centre. So, like, but there's, you know, the, the the pitch that's there now, they just built a stand there recently, and I think there's new dress rooms going in on the stand. But, I mean, it's, it's it, I don't know what the perception might be out there from people, but, like, Raquel, where Limerick trained for the majority of the year before the, the ground uh, hardens up and they go into the Gaelic grounds, is, 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 is a lovely facility to have, but there's one decent pitch there. Hmm. Yeah, but, and and, they, that, and you know you talk about Dublin underage teams like the seniors hurlers and rightly so and footballers get exclusivity to that one pitch. But for all the other teams that are there, you know you don't get that. So mm -hmm. all the other teams that are scrambling to go to different places, and I think like I was absolutely shocked and actually I want to saddened. No, it's a bit far, but to hear Joseph that they have to travel, you know, sixty miles to go to Abbeystown, that is just absolutely ludicrous. And I mean, the first thing that has to be looked at is to have proper facilities. So if I'm a Westmead player, I can jump into my car and I don't know, whichever side of the county I'm living at, well, then there's a proper place that we can go there and train. That's the least that should be given to, to, to a county. I just couldn't believe that I heard that. And yeah. the big, and the, 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 a much more complex part of the problem though, Jackie, is putting depth. Depth is depth of quality and depth of player is where you're ultimately going to make massive gains. And I think a proper program of games at club level is a challenge. Uh, proper uh, coaching right across the board is a challenge. But I mentioned this to you before. Hurling is more expensive 
to fund. It is more expensive to coach. You, if you're getting a football, you just buy a football away you go. It's jumpers for goalposts. It's almost like soccer. Hurling, you've got to buy a hurley. You've got to buy helmets. You've got to buy slitters. Slitters go missing a lot. <laughs> I could attest to that. Okay. So like, it's a much more expensive game to administrate on it's a more expensive game to coach it's a harder game to coach there's a different level of expertise required and that middle tranche of counties and when i talk about middle tranche i'm talking about westmeath leash kildare you could potentially put offley into that mix as well and antrim Carlo. maybe antrim carlo all of those counties i can't for the life of me understand why the requisite level of funding is not being put aside to try and get at least three or four of those teams up to be able to compete at proper Liam McCarthy Cup level. Hurling needs to be treated as a special case. Far too often, and this wasn't something that was addressed last night, which I think is an important point to make. Sometimes the GA looks at hurling as just us hurling and football, and they look at hurling in the same way that they look at football. You cannot have that as your starting premise. Hurling is a special needs to be treated as a special case. It is clinging on, as Peter Fortune said last night on the show, in certain counties. That to me is danger. I mean, the government, in some ways, needs to understand and needs to make, potentially step in here with strategies around preserving what is and not it's actually part of our national heritage. This is something that was inducted into the UNESCO um, Hall of Fame or whatever that category was a couple of years back like the cultural value that the game provides the nation is you know like it's you're talking about something that's five thousand years old so to see it just as a sport and from the ga's perspective to just categorize it as oh we'll have an old hurling development committee or we come up with this plan or that plan to me that is just going around in circles and it's just an uh, absolute guarantee of repetition of failure because that's what's effectively happened over the last 140 years and ultimately it ends up being left to you know people soldiering and plowing loan furrows in clubs and basically it, it, people that are you know taking on sort of pilgrimage roles to try and keep the game alive do you know what though i have never seen such a concerted approach by everybody involved in the game to want to make it better like, Shane, one thing that I think hurling is so unique in is that the people who have nine, ten All-Ireland medals, the people who have no All-Ireland medals, who've been, you know, playing away in Division 4, Division 3, in the Ring, the Mar, Cups, everybody is united in this. Whereas, like, in some other sports, if you took a Premier League footballer in England, let's say, and said, look, we're having a problem in League 1 or whatever, I don't think the investment or the opportunity is there for them to actually go and get their hands in it and do it all the people involved in hurling want to go on the ground they want to help I'm listening to people like Anthony Daly talking on his podcast saying how can I get out there how can I be involved in this people like Liam Sheedy people like Don Logue or Cusack if people like Don Logue are speaking like this why is it that we can't just say, let's get a fundamental approach, let's get enough people around the table, let's put a strategy in place in all of these counties and let's do something about it? Because the goodwill is there, but yet we're having the same conversation that we've been having for 10 years. I think it's called incompetent people. That's, I can't, like, you have all these people talking about it, but the people that are in charge aren't seem to do anything about it. So as far as I'm concerned, it's incompetent. If you're if you have somebody in charge and they're not listening to anybody, I just don't like you, you know, if you have to listen. You just have to listen. And if everybody, as you um spoke about there, Jack, you mentioned all them people are continuously talking about it, why can't something be done about it? And the only thing I'd I would like to add to, from Roy's point is yes, you need finance. You absolutely need money, no question. But it can't be all about money. Yeah. Because you can get whatever amount of money that you want. And you could give 10 million to all the clubs that are county boards that Rory mentioned there. But so, some people, they, they might have the right people in charge. So with, with finance, you need support and you need accountability because, you know, money is important. You need to buy the equipment. You need to get the center of excellences. You need to be able to pay coaches and people and whatever else. Right. You have to be able to do that. But then you need support and you need accountability. And all from what I can see at the minute is that there is no support. Like, I don't know the answer to this question. Martin Fogarty finished up in 2021. Why was he not replaced? Is there an answer for that? Maybe I should know. 
he, he hasn't yeah. been yeah he, he hasn't been replaced so why has he not been replaced are they trying to save money because they're saying there's a cost to getting somebody else in i love listening to him you but know, he has... but what 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 him and Paddy Butler had done previously to him was amazing but it still is only a one man show it seems to me it's almost like i was listening to adrian moran during the week the longford manager talking about there being only three senior teams in longford and i was thinking oh yeah but what about the intermediate and junior until he went on and said there's no intermediate and junior clubs and i was thinking if there's 20 football clubs how can there be zero hurling clubs in those places so some of it is yes the likes of having these inspirational characters who come in there Shane and want people to play the game like what Martin would have done in places but surely having the club there in the first place should be the first point and this is why we are I won't say that it might be in, in my lifetime right but we are so far away from getting this thing even remotely close to right but it has to start somewhere and as you said there, why is there only three hurling clubs? Like, surely there should be more clubs than that. So if the first port to call is setting up more clubs in these counties and getting the competitiveness within the county first. That's why I said, this thing could be 20 or 30 years away before we were, were potentially to see an Eachum or a Longford or a Loud or whatever competing in, 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 in hurling. And do you know what? It may never get there. They may never become Lee McCarthy due to population or whatever else. But support and finance have to be given to at least to try. It has. It somebody has to go and try these things, and I, the, I, I said, I, I remember when they were talking. Um, remember they, they tried to change a slitter and they mm-hmm. put the, the, the chip in the slitter, or whatever, right? The committee that was set up for that slitter, Brendan Cummins was inside it, right? Goalkeeper fucked God knows many thousand balls in his life. He would have been, as I would call it, the right person to be involved in that because he has plenty of experience in talking about slitters. So if if um, groups need to be set up to do this thing. Right, rather than us all talking about it, I'm sure people only love to help out if there was proper groups set up to go after this thing with the proper people. So Brendan Cummins in that scenario is a proper person to be put into that into that group. Go in and get proper people. People will 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 gladly do it voluntarily and support. But people at the very very top, first of all, need to realise that they need help and they need support to get this thing right. And I think like it's. It... Shane mentioned there about the right people being involved and having the right motive and having the right ambition. There is also the very real possibility and more probability that there are certain counties that don't want hurling, that don't actually want the game to thrive. They don't want to invest in it. They don't want to be seen to waste money and are quite happy to be classed as a football county and I don't know how you address that. That's a cultural thing. That's going to be very, very difficult to shift. Is it true? Maybe you incentivize in a financial sense if you make progress or do you penalize? That to me would be the obvious starting point on that on that side of things. But it will require a task force. It will also require a breaking down of the old order. The very notion, like he mentioned it last night, Peter Fortune, and I think this is something that will have to come onto the agenda. The fact there's only three hurling clubs in Loud. They can't play a championship with three clubs. So the the old county boundaries that are strangling hurling to a certain extent need to be done away with. If Loud, Mead and Armagh all come together to play uh, in, a, in a hurling league or a hurling championship, What's wrong with that? Don Lowe Cusack, uh, many moons ago, made the point about the potential of having an amalgamated team representing Ulster that could compete at Liam McCarthy Cup level. Didn't get off, didn't know so much as get off the ground as an idea because was shot down by vested interests. All of these things get poo-pooed but because they're radical and they're very much against the sort of conventional wisdom. But the conventional wisdom hasn't served us well. The game, as Peter mentioned last night, is dying in half the counties across the country. Yeah. And like, it's such a brilliant game. Like, that's the thing, Shane. Like, let's finish up on this because the one thing is... We all love when it. it. When it gets going and it's a show, imagine if there was a hurling festival on All Ireland Final Weekend and you had the Racker, the Ring, the Mar, they were all there. All the hurling people were there on one weekend and it was a spectacular sell to the world of this amazing thing it just it it seems so simple in theory because when you watch it you know people would buy into this game 
And I thought Joe, um, Joe Foster was spot on last night when he said stuff like that. Like, all Ireland hurling final again. Is it ever going to be a Super Bowl again? Of course it's not going to be that. Mm-hmm. But for us here in Ireland, and and, and plenty of um, countries of now as well, that have got many, uh, you know, relations and, and, and knows what hurling is, they should all be, you know, this is all, all, all Ireland weekend. Let's go to Ireland for this because this is uh, something special. And uh, But as you said, it sounds simple, but that's something that could be done. if Easy. they. If there was competent people in charge that would put their shoulder to the wheel and drive this thing, it should be a massive, massive weekend for us. And as you said there, it's like we all give back because I was brought up as a four, five and six year old walking down to the piership with my dad, you know, volunteers helping out. So when my time comes around like it is now, you you just want to give back. It's just a full circle. And it's, it, 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 it just means so much to everybody that's involved in the sport that when your time comes to play, you play. And when your time comes to give back, you give back. That's how I was reared. I think it's how the majority of us are reared. And, um, you know, we're, we're so lucky to be involved in it because the atmosphere, the, like as you said, the game itself, and you you know, fine now with the league and whatever, but when you come into Munster Championship, you look wow. at the Munster Championship last year, sure, it's, it, it, it's, what, it's actually what keeps some of us going. Talk, talk, going. talk about Netflix series. Well, imagine, imagine one covering the Munster Championship. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or even imagine like uh, see this is the problem with the GEA as well, right? If if somebody knocked on John Kylie's door and said, Hey, can we do a behind the scenes there? We'll have a Netflix documentary coming out, he'd run him a million miles, right? Because yeah. no, no, it's a GEA thing. We're afraid to show anything. And if I was in his shoes, I'd do the same. But like, why can a professional soccer team do it? But an amateur GEA can't. Can you imagine how much people would love to see behind the scenes of, of, of um, and teams? And this is all stuff that you'd love to just be thrown out there. And if you throw enough good things out there like that, some of them will stick. And we will come up with good ideas just to make it a bit more, uh, you know, better for people. But as I said, I'm just going to keep on using that word. Until there's competent people in charge, uh, I think we'll be having the same conversation again this time next year. Yeah, well, look... We're not going to solve these issues today, but it is encouraging to see people talking about it. And I think that has to continue because this thing, it's not going to solve itself. It really isn't. Um, But we're going to have to leave it there for the week, lads. Thoroughly enjoyed your company and looking forward to another bit of football at the weekend. Myself and Rory will be back on Thursday to look ahead to that one. And Shane, we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Enjoy the hurling. Enjoy fatherhood. Thanks a million for being with us. No problem. Thanks a million. Dublin lead by a point. And there's the whistle. It's over. It's over.